the Bundjalung Nation show. I just want to pay respects to these uh, indigenous custodians of the land um, and acknowledge uh, the fact that we're on their land at the moment. Uh, and we share the great beauty and uh, fruits of their wonderful custodianship for who knows how long. Um, so, big respect there. Um, I'm from Cubby Cubby land up in uh, the Sunshine Coast, so up that way we would say Wanya Nullum, which means welcome everybody. But down here, it's more Jingiwala. So, Jingiwala to everybody here. Let's keep it moving. So, a um, bit of a short story about how I came to be here talking about mushrooms. I uh, have a website which is called Responsible Choice. Um, it juxtaposes the dangers uh, and lack thereof of when, uh, when we compare alcohol to cannabis. And uh, I just want to take a quick time to say that uh, alcohol is the most dangerous drug. Sorry to those people out there who don't believe that's true, but the science is real, people. And I'll be showing you a little bit of that as we go on a little bit later. Uh, but certainly, cannabis is much more of a responsible choice in terms of a recreational drug because it's so much less harmful. And uh, recreationally, um, recreational availability of uh, cannabis can only mitigate the harms caused by alcohol because it gives us another choice that is non-toxic. So we're, we'll keep moving. Now, I'm going to start with a little bit of history around psilocybin mushrooms, their usage um, throughout the world, not just in Australia. But I'm going to try and keep it moving so that we have a little bit of time for questions at the end here. I am a bit of a blabbermouth, so please excuse me if I go off on tangents too much. My family will pull me in there. So, uh, very quickly, um, if we have a little look at... Uh, the slide here. This uh, image here is a <coughs> stone statue of a Aztec god, but I'll get to him in a second. What I want to talk about first is uh, a place called Tassilian Nangir Plateau in modern day Algeria, where uh, many, many artifacts have been found of a, quite an old civilization when the Sahara was green before it dried up and became a desert. And uh, certainly evidence left there in cave art suggests that the people who resided there were quite familiar with the uh, domestication of cattle and were therefore very familiar with psilocybin mushrooms because a lot of psilocybin mushrooms are coprophilic, which means they grow out of poo, uh, specifically ruminant cattle poo. So if, you, if you've got cattle around and it gets wet, uh, there's a strong chance that you're going to see mushrooms eventually. So. Uh, the people in the Tassilian G Plateau had a particularly striking cave art of what's been come to know, uh, be known as the Bee Shaman. Uh, most beautifully reimagined by um, uh, Terence McKenna's uh, partner at the time in his book, uh, Food of the Gods. I highly recommend a read of that book. Um, but certainly a, a bee headed uh, figure with his body surrounded by mushrooms, clutching mushrooms in both hands tends to suggest that uh, reverence was quite high for the uh, psilocybin mushroom back in the day. Now, if we, if we um, jump forward quite a way to this fellow, Yochipi, um, from uh, the Aztec people in South America, 16th century stone statue. Um, it's in the Museum of Anthropology in uh, Mexico City. A friend of mine, Liam Ingle, uh, who's a bit of a cactus man, to be fair, took this photo when he was there. And uh, it shows your chippy in uh, what many believe to be mushroom trance. So this is kind of what you can look like if you go there. Now, um, the reason that they made statues like this uh, was because they held your chippy in quite high regard. They called him the Prince of Flowers. Now, in uh, Mazatec and Aztec uh, language, flowers is a, is a word that is used to denote mushrooms. So, hence the... Uh, kind of association that we've got there, but he sits on top of a dais covered in lots of different uh, botanical motifs. Uh, most notable are the um, cross-section of the psilocybin mushroom spiraling, spiraling around in the front of him there. Uh, and oftentimes your chippy is used to uh, explain, you know, just how important um, uh, 
psychedelics were to ancient cultures, particularly to the Aztecs who developed, you know, ziggurats and astronomy and calendars and all sorts of um, quite high aspects of civilization. They held uh, the psilocybin mushrooms in quite high regard um, and they had a lot of uh, psychedelics available to them. Certainly they had um, ayahuasca and um, uh, peyote San Pedro cactus there too. So they weren't unfamiliar to these substances but um, psilocybin uh, was nominally used amongst the elites in Aztec culture. Um, moving further north to Mexico, we have um, uh, the story of Maria Sabina, who was a Mazatec curandera, which is kind of like a healer, I guess you would say, a shamanic healer. And she uh, was made famous when she um, invited a man named uh, R. Gordon Wasson to a healing circle that she had. And, and interestingly enough, um, uh, Maria Sabina's um, modality of using the mushrooms for healing involved her taking them on behalf of her patient. So the people who went to see her didn't take them necessarily. Sometimes she would take them and she would have that experience for them to ask the ancestors questions or the spirits questions about what she needed to do. I'm not exactly sure of her theological framework she worked out of, but certainly um, uh, uh, Wasson came back. He was a Wall Street banker, and um, there was a big, there was a big uh, piece in Time magazine about his trip to uh, encounter the magical fungi of Mexico, and a, uh, a lot of people followed in his footsteps, and um, thus began the uh, flourishing in the past of the psychedelics into the 60s and 70s. So as we move forward through history. We come across a lot of people who've advocated psilocybin mushrooms over the last 50 years. I'm just going to do a brief synopsis over these characters, and uh, if you're interested in any of this, you can go and look it up yourself, because it's all there. Um, so, most, uh, uh, one of the most notable people in modern times is an author named Michael Pollan. He's a journalist, he's an academic primarily. He just wrote another book, uh, which is called Your Mind on Drugs. I believe. It was more about uh, coffee and, um, I want to say, mescaline in there as well. Um, but he uh, wrote a book called How to Change Your Mind a couple of years ago, and it kind of chronicled his uh, experience with psychedelics um, as a journalist, uh, primarily interested in diet and um, food. Came across a lot of people talking about psychedelics and how uh, that aided their healing journey. And so he decided to look into it for himself. And uh, How to Change Mind kind of chron chronicles his discussions with all these experts uh, in the field who did a lot of research. A lot of research has been done in the past, um, throughout the 60s and 70s, before it was all squashed. Um, and he went on to uh, do mushroom um, ceremonies with various facilitators and um, smoked 5 meo DMT. I'm not going to go into that right now, but certainly gave it a good knock and came back to tell a good yarn about it as well. Um, next on the list is Paul Stamets, if you've never heard of him, he's a, a mycologist of some fame. Um, but he uh, has a, quite an intimate knowledge of mushrooms in general. He has a number of mycological patents that he's um, established. Uh, probably uh, one of my favourites is a fungal product that you put down near your beehives and the bees will instinctively go and harvest it and it raises the health of the hive and prevents the catastrophic failure of your hives. Um, but he's written a number of books, uh, probably most notably Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World, and uh, he's a very big advocate for the use of psilocybin mushrooms, um, personally because he had a very chronic stutter through his younger years and he credits he, uh, one significant psilocybin trip to healing his stutter. So um, he's quite an eloquent talker these days. Our uh, next person on the list is Kalindi E. Yi. Um, he's a master mushroom co he was, a master, a master mushroom cultivator, and also a master martial artist, specifically in terms of the African martial arts. He's an African American man. And uh, his advocacy certainly um, strayed into the territory of extremely high dosage. So, Kalindi E. Yi. Um, uh, if I can jump a little bit forward to uh, another fellow, Terrace McKenna, who I'll talk, speak to in a second, advocated um, five dry grams of cubensis mushrooms as being what he called the heroic dose, dose that's really going to um, get you close to what a lot of people would refer to as ego death. Um, Kalindi's conception of the heroic dose is more like about 40 dry grams, not five. So um, he certainly advocates the, the high dose um, 
Uh, and, and the reason for this is um, he has a theory that um, psilocybin is a, is a technology. Um, certainly it relies on saturation of the brain with a certain amount of psilocybin before the, the full uh, capability of that technology can be accessed. So um, he's advocating uh, massive doses and certainly professed that um, from his experiences as a ma master martial artist, that most martial systems that he knows of in the world were born of psychedelic experiences. So I'm going to leave that one to hang there. Um, the next person is Simon G. Powell, an author and a psychologist out of the UK. Um, he advocated to the UK government for them not to uh, make psilocybin mushroom sales illegal in the UK. For a very long time they were legal, up until sort of the early 2000s, I believe. Um, and he's, uh, yes, he's a very strong advocate, wrote a couple of books, um, Psilocybin Solution and Magic Mushroom Expl Explorer, both worth a read, um, but very eloquent, very powerful uh, points, um, most notably that psilocybin is completely non-toxic to the human being and um, that a lot of people um, garner a lot of benefit for it, uh, from it. The addiction potential is incredibly low for anybody who's ever encountered these uh, types of psychedelics. They don't necessarily encourage a return visit all that soon, uh, and that generally uh, that time period between when you want to do it again generally increases the higher the dose that you have. <coughs> so uh, next person along is Terence McKenna, very famous psychonaut and author and speaker, academic. Uh, he and his brother, um, oh, lost Dennis McKenna. Thanks, whoever typed that one up. Yes, shout out. Um, yeah, he and Dennis um, uh, made a bit of a trip down to the Amazon, had a, quite an extreme mushroom experience there, and um, came back and published a book on uh, the first cultivation book on uh, psilocybin mushrooms where you can grow it at home. Um, steep learning curve, apparently, I hear, uh, but well worth the fruits of your labour. Um, he's written a couple of seminal books, uh, most notably Foods of the Gods, which I mentioned earlier. Um, highly recommend a read. Um, just about the place of magic mushrooms in human evolution, um, he's certainly a big advocate of the stoned ape theory, namely that as apes we ate psilocybin mushrooms and they uh, allowed us to acquire language. I'm going to leave that one too. Uh, moving on to Timothy Leary, probably the most notorious of all these people, my namesake. Um, Psychologist and author um, followed in the footsteps of Gordon Wasson down to Mexico for a, a bit of a dose of the Mexican mushrooms and after a significant uh, dose claimed that he gained more psychological insight from that one dose than 10 years of psychotherapy. So I'm going to leave that one with you as well. Uh, but all these people, um, very strong advocates for the efficacy and value of psilocybin uh, in particular. So we're going to take a bit of a jump further into the modern day here, though it's not really the modern day. This science has been around for pretty much, you know, the best part of the last 20 years. Um, and the, the scientists who've been leading the charge here are um, Professor David Nutt and uh, Dr. Robin Carhart Harris and uh, Dr. Roland Griffiths, um, Americans and uh, Englishmen. Um, and they've done a lot of um, fMRI studies of um, psilocybin uh, in the human brain and how it affects our consciousness and what are the physiological, neurological con uh, correlates of a shift in human consciousness. Um, and so uh, the fruits of their research are sort of as follows. Is, um, psilocybin is really taken into the body very in a not too dissimilar way to cannabis in the sense that we ha it directly affects our serotonergic system. So psilocybin is recognized by the human body as serotonin, right? It, it hits the 5-HT2A receptors and um, is very much, um, just like the cannabinoid receptors, um, takes that, that uh, substance into the body and into the brain very quickly and very readily. Now, I need to mention this and emphasize this. <clears throat> psilocybin is completely non-toxic to the human body. Now, I've written LD50 there because I want to refer to what's known as a lethal dose 50. So that's a scientific uh, metric that we can use to measure how toxic a substance is. And certainly when you apply an LD50 to psilocybin, you uh, realize that to kill yourself off it, you would need to eat your body weight in dry mushrooms. 
I'm going to say that again. You would need to eat your body weight in dried mushrooms. Now, given that a standard, what I would call a standard dosage of mushrooms would be probably about three grams plus of dried mushrooms, you realise it's virtually impossible to eat that much. Um, so you literally cannot get that much down. Even Kalindi EE, who I spoke about before, 40 grams plus, 40 grams, not 100 kilos, never going to happen. So um, it's one of the most potent psychedelics, psilocybin in itself, and I guess I can be a little bit more specific here and, and talk a little bit more towards psilocin, because psilo uh, psilocybin is actually a precursor. When you take psilocybin, your body breaks it down into what we call psilocin, 4-NN-dimethyltryptamine. Um, and psilocin is actually what is, uh, has the psychedelic effect and, and the consciousness changing effect. Um, but uh, in itself, it is a, another version of what we call dimethyltryptamine. Um, now, there's various versions of um, DMT, um, but I just want to make the point that psilocybin is DMT. Psilocin is DMT. Um, it's the same thing, but a different form, different concentration, different route of administration as well. With psilocybin, generally, it's orally ingested. Um, certainly, with other forms of DMT, you can smoke it, and, and, and there's other ways to, in sulfation, other ways to do it. Um, that will see it come on much quicker and have the effect much stronger, um, but we're talking about a, a similar, similar group of chemicals here. So... Um, Certainly, uh, the word psychedelic, um, I, I'm quite a fan of that word. Um, there's a lot of terms floating around for, for these types of substances. Um, but psychedelic, coming from the Greek, um, sihi and dilaon, um, it means to manifest your mind. So what you see is your mind. Now, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of debate around what, um, what you see when you, when you take significant doses of these things. I'm not going to say, uh, argue for or against anyone else's opinion, but what I will say is, you'll definitely see your mind. You will definitely see your mind. So, um, essentially when we take most psychedelics, we have a significant change of circulation in our brain. So, uh, if I can sort of use the analogy of a, a workaday brain and a meditative brain. Our workaday brain is what we call our default mode network. And that's where we spend most of our time running in circles, um, discriminating between up and down, you and me, left and right, danger, safety. It keeps us um, able to cross the road and run away from fierce animals if we need to. Whereas our other part of our brain, uh, which is called our task positive network, can be summed up in the terms, uh, there is only one and everything is now. So this is where our consciousness is forcibly shifted when we take psilocybin or other psychedelics. Um, and it's facilitated by a change of circulation in the brain. So these um, networks in the brain are uh, heavily um, uh, innervated with blood. But when you take these substances, they literally withdraw blood from one part and push it into the other. So they force that consciousness shift, which a lot of people are uh, able to achieve through meditation and other techniques. I'm not going to go into that now. I would also like to mention that, that research has been done on psilocybin that uh, confirms that it changes the personality of the user after every dose. So it doesn't, if you only take a small amount of it, it's going to change you. Will everybody around you know? Maybe not. Maybe you'll only be the person that knows. The more you take of it, the more it will change you. Okay, so uh, this has quite significant ramifications for addiction and, and other uh, problematic behaviours and mental disorders. So we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, but certainly, when we're talking about um, addiction and uh, chronic depression, uh, I like to use the analogy of the ski field. So if you can imagine when you're born, uh, you're standing at the top of a ski field and your mind is this, this powder snow, this slope of powder snow. It hasn't been skied down before, it's just perfectly white, blanket over everything. You could do anywhere, go anywhere. And so you choose it and you go down a slope and you navigate and you get to the bottom and you go, okay, that was a safe route, I got there, I'm okay. Your likelihood to ski down that same route is increased every time you go down it, until it's a very worn route. You know exactly where it goes, you know exactly how to go down it, you could do it with your eyes closed. Unfortunately, a lot of our addictive and uh, negative mental health states are just that. We keep going down the same route, the same groove, and we can't get out of it. We get stuck in a bit of a, a merry-go-round. And so uh, where um, psychedelics come in, 
Psychedelics are like a brand new fall of fresh powder snow on your slope. So when you go to the top of it again, you're like, okay, I'm not going to go down that same route that's been causing me all this trouble. I actually have a bit of perspective and a bit of time to say, okay, being down that way didn't work out all that well. Maybe that way, maybe this way. There's infinite ways now. So we can open up our neural pathways to accommodate different behaviours uh, different behaviors that can hopefully free us from some of these um, sort of, um, how can I put it, negative mental states. Um, and I just want to also touch on the fact that synthetic psilocybin is not equivalent to a dose of wild mushrooms. And by that I mean, if you have synthesized psilocybin, which is um, modern pharmaceutical science is making big efforts to do that, and not necessarily from mushrooms, all you need is a precursor drug that you can, or substance that you can derive psilocybin from, and that's not necessarily exclusively located in mushrooms. Um, in a clinical context, if I give you synthesized psilocybin, that is not going to be the same as if you take wild mushrooms, because wild mushrooms have so many other chemicals and substances in them that modern science is only now just starting to get their head around what they actually do, and if they're even there. Um, so when you get a dose of synthetic psilocybin, will you have a certain experience? I'm sure you will. Will it be the same as if you ate wild mushrooms? Absolutely not because there's so many other things in there. It's a bit more of a cocktail rather than a uh, purely synthesized, isolated chemical. So what we're looking at here is um, relative drug harms. Uh, this is a multi-criterion decision analysis. Professor David Nutt, I mentioned earlier, he published this study in about 2010-2011. He outlines all of the most commonly used drugs in the UK and their harms to the user and the people around the user. And right up this end, uh, no guesses from my spiel at the start what was the most harmful. It's alcohol with a score of 72 out of 100. Now, the red part of that uh, bar is harm to the people around the users, uh, around the user of alcohol. So that's why it scored such a high, uh, it's why it got the highest score. Um, most notably about this research for me is the very last one the least harmful substance, which is psilocybin mushrooms. So uh, this certainly got me uh, thinking about, well, uh, why have we got these laws in place at the moment where alcohol is the most dangerous drug, I can walk out of here and drink as much as I want. Psilocybin mushrooms, the least dangerous drug, and you'll see what happens to me in Queensland if I've got 0.1 of a gram in just a moment. So. Um, my talk here tonight is largely about harm reduction, which is, it comes from the idea that if you're a young man or woman out there and you decide you want to tr take drugs, we cannot stop you. We can educate you, but we cannot stop you. You are human beings, sovereign human beings, you'll do what you like. So if that's the case, I need to give you as much information about how to engage with it safely as I can so that when it is your choice you actually know what to do and you're not going to get yourself in a lot of trouble, you can actually get in there and, and do it as safely as is possible um, and come back home to your family and, and your loved ones. So psilocybin mushrooms from a harm reduction perspective, they can be very, very challenging on many, many levels. It's certainly not a case or a given that it's going to be a walk in the park and you're going to have unicorns and rainbows and high-fiving everybody and it's all rosy. It's quite possible that you're going to be bawling your eyes out in a fetal position on the floor for, you know, maybe four hours. Depends on how much you took. Um, so we're talking about psychological impacts, physical, emotional and spiritual impacts. What you used to place value on, you might not place value on that so much anymore. It might have significant ramifications for your life and the choices that you make afterwards. So, dosing in dried grams is essential for safe use. So, I still speak to a lot of people about mushrooms and they come and they want to tell me about a mushroom experience they had and the first thing I say is, how much did you take? And so many people say, I don't know. And I shake my head and say, no, let's try and be scientific about this. Let's try and be careful. Um, because certainly, as I'll talk about in a moment, not all mushrooms are the same. So you might have had mushrooms one time and a handful was good. The next time they're different mushrooms, a handful is, whoa, very different. So please, please, 
dose in dry grams, weigh your dose. Um, all of my um, standards are in uh, reference to psilocybe cubensis, which is a bit of a benchmark around the world in terms of potency of um, psilocybe mushrooms. So I'm going to speak to the mushrooms that we have in Australia, in, uh, it's specifically in Queensland and northern New South Wales here in a moment. Um, but what we're talking about m more often than not in uh, New South Wales and in Queensland are what we call cubensis mushrooms or gold tops or I don't know what everyone calls it, gold caps or whatever you want to call them. We call them cubes up my way because cubes are short for cubensis. Now, cubes are half as strong as Paneolus cyanescence, which are another uh, psilocybin mushroom. They're not from the genus psilocybe, but you'll certainly find them around here. People call them blue meanies, um, pan cyans. They've got a few different names, but they're very different. And they're twice as strong. And they're half the size. So if you don't know what you're doing, it could be a pretty bad night pretty quickly. So I'm just going to talk about four basic trips in, in, in terms of weight, dry weight, and we'll come to questions at the end, sister, for sure. So 0.1 of a gram, and, and certainly there's going to be a, a, a young lady who's going to be speaking after me more specifically about microdosing uh, psilocybin MDMA, so I don't want to steal her thunder. So I'll go over this very quickly. 0.1 to about 0.5 of a gram in my conception is what we would call a microdose. Okay, it depends on the mushroom. I'm talking about cubensis mushrooms as a benchmark. If you're using panscience or psilocybe subarrogonosa or psilocybe semilanciata, you want to be a lot more careful. Uh, Liberty caps and um, subs are much more potent than cubensis mushrooms. Um, so. In terms of our microdose, it's not supposed to be a noticeable dose. You're not supposed to feel like you're having a psychedelic experience. But it's supposed to be sub-threshold dose, so you can take it. Your body knows, your serotonergic system knows you've had it, but your workaday consciousness is uninterrupted. So you can go on doing whatever it is you normally do uh, without sort of feeling like you need to take a pause and, and watch everything breathe and look at all the colours and all the rest of it. Uh, above that, a sort of a more nature appreciation dose, I'd say about 0.5 of a gram to about 3 grams of cubensis mushrooms. Um, that's going to probably give you some pause and, and make you want to sit down and appreciate exactly what it is you're seeing, hearing, feeling. Uh, but you can still appreciate where you are and you're conscious, conscious of your surroundings. Again, it's going to be mushroom specific. Um, from there, you're going towards a more uh, mid-range dose, 3 to 5 grams. It's going to be quite substantial for uh, first time users for sure um, and certainly I'll be encouraging trips sitting from that dose upwards if it's your first time. Um, certainly 5 to 12 grams is where you start to get into quite a macro dose um, and certainly the potential for what we call ego death is, is, is quite real at that dose um, and I'll get into that in a minute. And then 12 plus you're not going to know where you are, what your name is. <laughs> You're going to forget a lot of things in your immediate environment, um, but you might remember some things from your distant, distant past, which might give you significant pause and, and maybe you want to sit in that space for a bit and work out why that's still with you. Certainly we're, we're moving into um, a dose that you know, is likely to elicit a mystical experience uh, where you speak to God, speak to Buddha, see Jesus, um, you know, have a chat with long dead um, ancestors, spirit beings, whatever you want to call it, take 12 grams of mushrooms and check that out. I know I'm saying that in all, in all jest, don't do that. That would be really silly. Um, this is something that I would encourage, you know, from a harm reduction sense, really go going slowly and being mindful about what it is that you're doing and how you're doing it. So typical effects, um, we're looking at quite a lot of yawning initially at the come up from um, a lot of psychedelics, it's a very similar effect. Um, but you might be feeling some different body effects, a body load is what we, what we refer to that as. You might feel tingling, you might feel heavy in your body, you might even feel a bit sleepy. Uh, but once, once that's fully uh, in your system, you're going to have all sorts of uh, potential visual uh, effects, both open eye and closed eye. Um, a lot of psychological, emotional uh, work going on there. And hopefully getting a little bit of a different perspective on a lot of things that you've worked through in your life that may still be giving you pause. Um, trip sitting, again, as I mentioned before, a very important um, practice for those who are very new to the space. Um, certainly, as I mentioned, psilocybin is, is completely non-toxic to the human body. However, 
taking significant doses of psilocybin and not actually understanding what it is that you're getting yourself into can lead you uh, into some interesting scenarios potentially. So you want to have someone that you know and love very close to you for that so that you can feel confident that someone is looking after you and making sure that you're getting the assistance and support that you may or may not need. Uh, and, I, and I also will say uh, most psychedelics put you into an incredibly um, susceptible state uh, and by that I mean you're incredibly susceptible to suggestion. So when you're in that state you really want to be around people that you really trust and love that are going to give you that encouragement that you, that you really need at that time and to help you take advantage of the potential healing that, that can take place there. Um, and lastly, just want to talk about ego death. Um, again, quite, uh, quite a popular topic that a lot of people ask me about. Um, and what we're talking about here is a complete dissolution of the self. So that when you take this, uh, an ego death, as I said, you, you're talking more, uh, probably five grams and up for most, most healthy adults of cubensis mushrooms. You're talking about complete disassociation from your physical body. Your sense of identity, who you are, where you are, what you are, is no longer there anymore. It's just like your, your connection to this physical material reality is cut and you're just left to float out in the universe or wherever it is that you go. Um, because it's customised to your consciousness and when you return it may take you some time to reconfigure yourself. I think I'll leave it at that. So we're going to talk about Queensland law. I'm from Queensland and uh, our laws are very interesting. Now uh, last time I gave this talk I didn't have my trusty old PowerPoint presentation here so I gave a little bit of a quiz to the audience and I said how much, uh, how long would I be looking at going to jail for if I just walked up to a random stranger and punched him in the head? Say I had a few, I'd been on the grog a bit, I got a bit rowdy. Someone looked at me wrong, gave him a punch to the head, knocked him out. How long do you reckon I'd be going, would I, what would I be up for there? Anybody want to chime in there? No jail. No jail? Just a fine for that, knocked him out. Acquired brain injury, maybe. Oh, okay. One, year. One year, they're talking. Can I get two? She gave me two, all right. So we're talking about maybe a, a very tentative two years for knocking someone out, giving them acquired brain injury. Let's have a look at how Queensland looks at this stuff. So we're talking about the Drugs Misuse Act in Queensland of 1986 and the Misuse Regulation of 1987. Now in Queensland, psilocybin and psilocin are Schedule 2 dangerous drugs. Why are they dangerous drugs? Because they're dangerous. Why are they dangerous? Because they're dangerous drugs. It's very circular. Um, I still haven't got to the bottom of that. Regardless, 0.1 of a gram can equal a $590,000 fine and or 25 years in prison. Give it up for Queensland, everybody. Doing it big. We know how to do it big up there. So as I said before, in terms of dosage, this is not even a microdose. 0.1 of a gram is sub-threshold dose for most people, most adults. Now, uh, part of the reason for my justification for writing this book, this is all about this book that I wrote. Hey, it's this one. Um, it is crazy that in this day and age for a mushroom that you will know how to identify at the end of this presentation if you have one of them on you if you and people might people come to me and say oh look Tim no judge is going to do that and I'm like okay that's probably a fair enough but can they can they is the question the answer is yes they can which is crazy so we need to raise awareness of uh, our laws, not only around cannabis, but a lot of other uh, psychedelic and plant medicines, and uh, start to really query why they have the classification they do based on their harms. We all would assume it's because it's incredibly harmful, but I said it's completely non-toxic to the human being. How can that paradox exist? Uh, because it's the law, bro. So it's classed the same as 2 grams of speed, cocaine or heroin, or 20 grams of opium, or if I had 100 plants. The same fine and sentence applies in Queensland. Yeah. Questions. So, 
The questions are, when do I find these things and where? Well, I'm going to tell you. So, first we need to start with environmental factors. We want the temperatures to be over 22 degrees. Now we're talking about generally the wet season up here. Um, soil temperatures want to be upwards uh, around 20 degrees, 19, 20 degrees. Now we can, we can largely base our assessment of that on ambient nighttime temperatures. We want them up in the high teens, close to 20 degrees. The wet season in southeast Queensland is from November uh, on to March. It, it can go later, it can go right into May. Um, but it's similar to down here. Now we want that rain because um, mushrooms, especially the psilocybes that I'm going to talk about, are 90% water. Unless the water table is right up and there's so much water around, like literally the air is 100% humidity, they won't come out. They need that. They need that moisture. They're very, very uh, have a strong affinity with water. So we really want that rain, as I say, in, in excess of 200 mils in sort of 24 to 48 hours. We want that pounding down rain. No, we don't. We don't want that down here, but for mushrooms, we do. Um, and it's elevation dependent. Obviously, if you're up in the mountains, you've got fields up there, the water table is going to take a lot longer to rise up. If you're down in the flatlands where there's already water in the ground, you're only going to need a significant dump of about 50 mils, and you're going to get that squelch, squelch. That's what, that's what we're after. So the humidity is around 100% uh, ideally um, because, as I say, that means there's literally water in the air, which for mushrooms is perfect. Um, we want ruminant cattle. Now, ideally cows. Um, it doesn't matter, beef or um, dairy. Uh, horses, goats, alpacas as well. That All of that type of poo of those ruminant animals um, seems to be quite okay for the psilocybes I'm going to talk about. Um, and we're looking at pasture land. They love grass. The, the um, mycelium is um, very fond of cow poo and will colonise it very, very quickly because it's so nutrient dense and it can distribute all of the, um, the nutrients from that cow poo in its uh, vast web-like network under the ground to all of the trees. Uh, if you watch Fantastic Fungi that Sister's going to drop later on, you'll get a lot more info about that and lovely visuals for it too. Um, but we really want that green, lush grass. Uh, we want some shade trees for the cattle to congregate around and poo a lot. Or we want to find where the cows are fed and gather to eat because there will be lots and lots of poo. If you find the poo, you find the mushrooms. It's as simple as that. So you want to find where the cows are a lot in, en masse and where they hang out for, for a lot and, and really um, spend some time to poo a lot. That's where you'll find them. Uh, the shade trees, obviously, the cows want to get out of the, the hot summer sun. So under those shade trees, not only will you find a lot of poo, but they create a beautiful microclimate uh, where the, the humidity is quite different and the, um, the water kind of rains through for a lot longer than down, uh, out in the open. And we want to avoid glyphosate in general, but certainly when we're talking about mycelium, it, we want to avoid it like the plague because it kills mycelium. So moving on to identification, we're going to start with um, a couple of golden rules. Now, I'm a teacher, so forgive me, but just to get your understanding, I'm going to get you to repeat these rules back to me, okay? So the four rules, the golden rules for our psilocybin identification in South East Queensland and Northern New South Wales are as follows. Rule number one, no poo, no can do. What was it? Straight up. If it's not going out of poo, I'm not even going to look at it. I'm not even going to look at it. If I'm out there to pick these types of mushrooms, if it's not going out of poo, nope. Nope. Mounds of grass where there's poo all around? Yes, fine. Just random grass in someone's backyard? Nope. Nope. Not unless they've had ruminant animals around there, or they've had a lot of mushroom spore that they've just chucked out there, or something like that. A bit rare. Um, no poo, I'm not even going to look at it. Rule number one, if it's got poo, ooh, I'm interested. Rule number two, no gill, just chill. What is it? No gill, just chill. Exactly. If it doesn't have gills on it, like these mushrooms, you can see the gills on these cubensis mushrooms. By the way, these are both cubensis mushrooms. These two here and this one cut in half. But you can see the gills. These are agaric mushrooms. These are characteristic of uh, agaric mushrooms with the the line gills underneath it. If it doesn't have gills, I'm not going to touch it. So it's got, it's poo, it's in poo, I look at it, no gills, move on. 
If it's got the sponge underneath, the uh, bolete, no, definitely not. Not touching that. So, on to number three. Rule number three is, if it ain't blue, it ain't true. What is it? That's right, that's because uh, when psilocybin oxidizes, when it hits oxygen, it turns blue. Now, I don't know if you can see, uh, if I'm in the way here, of these uh, beautiful Paneola cyanescens, very small mushrooms, but the stems are bruised where I've pinched them. They turn dark blue. Dark blue. Now, the uh, Cubensis mushrooms turn a more like a turquoise, a greeny blue, but they definitely turn blue. You pick them and you look at it for a while, just leave it in the air, I'll pick it and put it down for a bit, come back later and you're like, oh, that's blue. Yeah, if it ain't blue, it ain't true. If I pick it and it doesn't go blue, hoik, nah. So, golden rule number four, take a print to get a hint. What is it? Exactly. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean a spore print. That's what we're looking at there. If I take a big mushroom cap and I snap the stem out and I take that cap and I put it on a flat surface, ideally a piece of paper or something like that, or maybe a bit of foil. Depends if I want to collect those spores for future propagation. Not advocating that. Um, we take it and we put it down and we put a glass container over it so the humidity really greatly increases in that little chamber. Leave it overnight. I take the container off, I pick up that mushroom cap and that's what it's going to leave. It's like a tattoo of the mushroom. It's dropped all its spores. Now the reason that the spore print is very important is because uh, mushrooms have quite unique coloured spores. So with the psilocybe cubensis mushroom, it has a very, very dark purple spore print. Very dark purple. Um, whereas the spore print that we're looking at at the moment is from... Uh, sorry, that is a cubensis um, spore print. You can see it's a little bit purple. The mushrooms next to it, the Pana, uh, Paneola cyanescens, they have a jet black spore print. Black is black. So when I take them home, if they've passed those other um, golden rules, and I'm like, yeah, check one, check two, check three, poo, gills, it's blue. I check my spore print. If it's black or it's purple, then I'm pretty close. I follow those golden rules. I can be like, ooh, no, this isn't going to hurt my tum-tum. So, lastly, even if I've done all of those things, ideally I've taken a photo of this mushroom in the ground, in the poo, so that I can send that photo to educated folk. Like you'll find at the Shaman Australis Botanical Forums or at the Shroomery, post your photo up and say, what's this? Is this what I think it is? And you'll have people that, botanists and all sorts of crazy folk who will go, yes, that's this type of mushroom, or no, or does it have this, or where did you find it? They'll ask you questions about it to help you confirm. But if you've followed those four golden rules, chances are what you've got in your hands is definitely a psilocybin mushroom. So, cubes or pans, which one is which? Let's have a look. So we're going to start with psilocybin cubensis mushrooms. They're the pretty archetypal mushroom that you'll find around here. Gold tops, goldies, I don't know what you call them down here, what, what the slang is. We call them cubes. Now they're the atypical magic mushroom, very common around the world. Uh, various iterations of the cubensis mushroom, but they're found on most continents in the world. Now they have a white to golden cap on a white stem. Now the colour of the cap can vary wildly, as you've seen. This one is really orange and it's got little white dots on it. Um, one of the other distinguishing features of the cubensis mushroom is it has a veil remnant. So if I can use the microphone again, uh, when the mushroom comes up, it's what we call a pin. It's closed. And as it grows, it, the cap opens out like an umbrella head. Where the cap was joined to the stem, you'll find a veil remnant. It's like a little wavy, um, purpley grey um, uh, membrane that's left behind where the cap broke out away from the stem. It's very uh, very noticeable on the cubensis mushroom. As I say, it stains blue-green. Various presentations, sometimes they're really orange, sometimes they're really yellow, sometimes they're pale, like white. Um, sometimes they're purple because they create their own microclimate underneath and their purple spores fly up on top of them, they get like a dusting of purple all over them. I'll show you a few photos now. In terms of um, 
the, the potency, it's what we kind of use, or what most people would use as a benchmark in terms of its potency. Um, and they don't vary too much, too wildly um, from Cubensis species to Cubensis species. They're all very similar. So what we've got here is a couple of different presentations of the uh, Cubensis mushroom. I'm going to just stand over here and get in all these people's way. Now I'm going to stand over here and duck down and get out of the way. So we've got um, uh, an old, uh, a mature and a young Cubensis mushroom here. You can see the very small one that's just in what I would call a pin state. It hasn't yet opened up like an umbrella, like the big white one. But you can see the pin very orange. I don't know if you can see it down there. Orange and white, and the big one's really white. These are all probably grown from the exact same um, spores, but their potency can be wildly different. Now, in this photo, I don't know if you can see this sort of purple on the caps of these cubensis mushrooms. Very typical presentation. They can be white, wavy capped. They can be quite flat. They can even invert a little bit. They can get quite slimy. Uh, uh, there's various mycological terms for this, but I'm just keeping it fairly layman. Um, so we've got a really good picture of a, a pin here and a more mature mushroom. Um, now obviously the mushroom only opens up like an umbrella because it wants to release its spores. That's its goal. Uh, it is the fruiting organ of the mycelium. So we're just continuing on. They can get quite big. That cubensis mushroom uh, in the centre of that photo that's cracked in half was almost 18, 19 centimetres in diameter. Um, they can get massive. Um, cubensis mushrooms can be very, very big, very hefty, use a lot of water. Um, generally speaking, in terms of their fruiting, they come up later than the mushrooms I'm going to show you next, the Panaeolus cyanescens, because these guys use so much more water. They need a lot more water to come up. Um, so uh, this is an interesting photo where we've got a mature cubensis um, mushroom and then we've got some tiny Paneola cyanescens next to them. So you can see how small these other mushrooms are by comparison. They're tiny, but they are two and a half times as potent as the big ones. So you need to really respect that, um, I, I would suggest, um, if you want to stay safe. So we're moving on to... Uh, another genus of mushroom, Paneolus. Now there's a lot of Paneolus mushrooms around the traps. Most of them you could probably eat and they're not going to give you much more than a, a, a bit of an upset tummy. Uh, but for some reason, Paneolus cyanescens is a psilocybin containing mushroom. It's not from the genus psilocybin. It doesn't grow the same as the cubensis mushroom does. It is coprophilic though. It loves poo and it loves water just as much as the cubensis mushroom does but they're much, much smaller. So generally less than half the size of a cubensis mushroom. Uh, they're white or grey cap and they'll have, usually have a little, like a little fairy fingerprint of gold on the top of them. Um, but the, the cap can, be, can vary a lot. They can be completely flat. They can be like a bullet shape. They can be domed like these ones here. They have no veil remnant. When they come up, they just open up like an umbrella. They, they aren't fused um, like the cubensis mushrooms are. Um, and as I say, they're one of many Paneolus species. So the, the Paneolus cyanescens, or the blue meanie, needs to be a little bit, you need to be a little bit slower with your identification. The cubensis mushroom is a little bit more obvious. Paneolus can look like a lot of other mushrooms, so we really need to honour those uh, four golden rules. Um, it, it stains dark blue. Uh, as I say, the cubensis is a bit more blue-green. But it's one of the most potent mushrooms in the world. Um, it has a very high, on average, psilocin content, um, as opposed to psilocybin. So cubensis will have a lot of psilocybin, which converts in your body into psilocin. Oh, then I have the experience. These are full of psilocin. It's already converted. As soon as you take them, go straight. You'll, the come up is much quicker, and the, the effect is much more pronounced and, and very quick. Um, but again, um, experientially, it's going to vary on what's going on for you. But certainly, um, very potent and not to be taken lightly, and certainly not to be taken by the handful, by the pinch, whatever. We want to be a little bit methodical and careful with it. Dry grams is better. So, these are quite small. Um, these, most of these mushrooms wouldn't be more than sort of 10 centimetres high. Um, in this photo, you can see the, uh, the uh, mushrooms in the background here. This was very dry. The reason I included this photo is because they don't need a lot of water, these ones, because they're much smaller. 
but the mushroom cluster in the background, you can see the black spores that have been dropped by the topmost mushroom on the ones on the caps of the ones underneath. So that 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 sort of presentation will help you uh, with your identification if you already can see the spore print colour. Um, and there we have them again. Uh, with with Paneola cyanescens, you want to really get down and have a look. If you want to find them, you have to seek them. Uh, the cubensis mushrooms will jump out to you like golden Easter eggs in the in the fields, uh, but the pan science can be a lot more elusive. So um, I wanted to give a little bit of time for questions. The sister over here had a question that I haven't forgotten about that. Uh, but a few closing thoughts just on this whole spiel. So largely what I've been commenti uh, commenting on is the war on drugs. We had a look at the Queensland drug laws there regarding psilocybin. Absolutely insane. Um, why is that the case? Well, we're still stuck in the war on drugs. If you think the war on drugs is finished, go to a jail and talk to some people who are in there. I guarantee you there's going to be a vast majority of people in there for drug-related offences. So it keeps a lot of our brothers and sisters incarcerated. As I put here, it's a ridiculously expensive failure. It has achieved none of the things it was supposed to achieve, and we still keep dropping so much of our tax dollars into it for nothing. So it actually uh, fosters crime because it makes the black market. We create it. When we, when we criminalise it, whoever's willing to take the risk will reap the rewards. We create that. So, uh, it, it, again, we, it, we create the, the climate for that type of crime, but then who, who suffers for it? The sick, the mentally ill, minorities, our indigenous brothers and sisters. You know, these people go to to drugs for some sort of comfort, and what do we do? Chuck them in jail. That'll fix them. Righto. Um, so yeah, it, uh, not only all of those things, it encourages contempt for the law. I'm not going to be inclined to listen to you, officer, when your law is total bullshit. And it's actually discriminant against so many people, and it's so damage damaging, so your authority is lessened. It's not increased. So it doesn't help law enforcement laws like this. It actually hampers them. I was here last year and Michael was out there saying, free the cops, change the law, straight up. They've got more important stuff to do instead of this. Um, so when we're talking about people and their drug use, more often than not, we're talking a, a lot of the conversations framed around addiction. Now, um, very interesting guy, uh, Gabo Mate, and Johan, uh, Johan Hari has spoken a lot about this in his book, Chasing the Screen. But I want to talk more about Gabo Mate in The Realm of Hungry Ghosts as one of his book's titles. And that's due to the fact that the addict is like the hungry ghosts in the Buddhist kind of um, conception of different bardos and all the rest of it, where you, you go to a realm and you've got this massive hole in your tummy. You're so hungry all the time, but you've got a tiny mouth. So you'll never, ever, ever satisfy that hunger. This is his picture of what it's like to be an addict. Now, most addicts have had horrific trauma early in their life, right? So if, you, if, we, if we go, okay, these people are taking drugs not because they want to get out of it, they want to have a party time. A lot of people are taking hard drugs just so they can feel like you and I feel now, just to sit here like a normal human being. They don't feel like there's rainbows and unicorns. They feel like they can function because their life was so terrible, they're just trying to deal with it. So, again, how do we deal with people like that? Chuck them in jail. Yeah. We need to really check that behaviour and, and check that mindset because what all these people are seeking is connection and healing. That's all they want. That's all, all anybody who takes drugs. These people don't want to go out on the street and sell their bodies to put this poison in, their, in themselves. They don't want to do that. But they feel like that's all they can do because they just want to be accepted, they just want to feel loved, they want to feel like a normal human being. And we criminalise that. So when we look at the cause of addiction and we start to try and address people's disconnection from their community and from their family and all the rest of it, then we can start to actually make some inroads into healing instead of taking these poor people and chucking them in jail. There's no healing there at all. Um, so benefits of psilocybin use, uh, I just want to make the point, it's not only for people that are unwell. Um, certainly the already well can benefit from, from exposure to these types of substances. But um, as my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu professor once said, it is for everyone, but it's not for everyone. Okay? If you take it, will you die? No. Will you enjoy it? Eh, depends.
depends on the person. Depends on your past. Depends on what type of person you are now. Depends on so many different things. So it's not for everybody, but it can be for everybody. It's not going to hurt you the way that uh, crack cocaine or heroin or alcohol is going to. So um, in terms of uh, retail models and, and availability into the future, certainly Mind Medicine Australia is making quite the push to have a very mild rescheduling of uh, psilocybin and MDMA for therapeutic uses. I don't necessarily advocate uh, that approach. I think we just need to focus on educating people. Not about trying to make a, a little tricky baziki gap in there so people can, can capitalise and some people can have access to it and some people can't. Uh, we've done that too many times in this country for too many different things. So I think that as, as much as possible, if we're all educated about this stuff, we take responsibility for our, our health into our own hands, then we don't have to rely on uh, potentially questionable sources. So um, just to that, standard, standardization of the dosage, um, is it possible that the pharmaceuticalization of uh, these types of plant medicines in the future will seek to make a standardized dose? But as I've already said, if I take a dose the same as sister here, we're different people. She's Not only that, she's a different gender to me. So there's no way we're going to have the same response. There's no way. It might turn out positive for both of us. I might be giggling my head off. She might be in the fetal position screaming for the next two hours. Straight up, that's the difference. So trying to, trying to put it into the, oh, this pill will do this for you model, uh, I'm, I, I have doubts about that. Um, certainly, I am all for um, further um, availability of these types of substances, but certainly education, as I say, is the key. I just want to leave you with one last thought before I have some questions. This is a, uh, a report which was done by the Think Tank Australia 21, and I just want to read the title. This was uh, back in 2012. It, the title of it was, The Prohibition of Illicit Drugs is Killing and Criminalising Our Children and We Are All Letting It Happen. That's the title. That's the title. 2012, Bob Carr... All these pollies, ex-pollies, bloody all these people were a part of this and they came up with it. And one of the last recommendations of this report is this. It is time to stop sloganeering and insist to all of our political representatives and to our media that Australia must have an informed national debate about the alternatives to a policy that has failed disastrously and is criminalising our young. Straight up. So, please consider what I've brought to you today. If you are interested in looking at anything more along these lines, certainly this is my website, Responsible Choice. That's my email address and uh, my book, Psilocybin Mushrooms of South East Queensland, Australia, this one here, which contains all of the golden rules, lots of lovely photos in there, history, science, all the rest of it. Um, I even got lovely Professor David Nutt to write a shout line for me. He said... I'm pleased to see the principles of evidence-based harm reduction being so prominently endorsed by this timely book. Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you very much for listening, everyone. It's been a pleasure to be back down amongst the Mardi Gras crew. <laughs> Any questions? To start. Uh, as far as I understand, there's not, and certainly um, the evidence uh, that I've been exposed to, the research that I've been exposed to, is that psilocybin actually contributes to what we call neurogenesis, or the growing of new neurons in the brain. Now, Paul Stamets uh, is well aware of this research, and he advocates a, um, a more for people with degenerative or cognitive disorders, he advocates a stacking um, regime of microdosing. I'm not advocating it here, I'm just providing you with this information, uh, which he provided everyone with. And he takes a dose, a microdose of psilocybin, with um, B6 uh, for the peripheral blood uh, stimulation, especially to the end of the neurons, and uh, lion's mane as well, because it is known to remove amyloid plaque from the brain, um, which up until recently has been associated with um, Alzheimer's and things like that. But research uh, that has been undertaken recently shows that there is not this, this substantial link that we have been led to believe there. Uh, but certainly, 
psilocybin um, has been shown, certainly in a lot of rat studies, we're big on the rat studies these days, uh, neurogenesis is certainly a uh, part of the uh, effect of psilocybin in the human and mammalian brain. Uh, well, there's a couple of people uh, who are pretty notable out there um, in terms of their um, professed microdosing regime. Uh, one is Paul Stamets and the other one is uh, James Fadiman, who's uh, been in psychedelic science for a long time. Uh, so Fadiman pr uh, promotes a uh, one day on, uh, two days off sort of model with microdosing. And sister who's up after me will probably speak more to this. Uh, whereas James Fadiman, uh, sorry, uh, um, James Fadiman is sort of one day, then two days off, one day on, two days off, and that's because when you take um, most plant medicines and certainly most psychedelics, your body um, induces a very high tolerance straight away. So if I take a big, let's say I take five grams of mushrooms tonight, and I want to wake up in the morning and take another five grams of mushrooms, that'll do nothing. The second dose will do nothing. My body, my tolerance is raised by my body so high that it won't really matter. Um, so it takes a lot of time before your body um, lowers that tolerance, and usually it's about two or three days for most people. So um, that's why Stamets has uh, sort of um, framed his regime in the way he has. But Fadiman, um, oh, sorry, that's Fadiman. Stamets is much more um, sort of five days on, two days off. He, he's much more trying to keep that uh, that dosage consistent, but smaller. Yeah. F-A-D-I-M-A-N, I believe. Cool. More questions. Sister down the front, you've been waiting so patient. That's all right. Um, oh, my question was just about the uh, the difference between the, uh, you know, you, you're saying don't eat them fresh ever. They should always be dry. And if so, how do you dry them? And, okay. And the weight you're talking about is the dry weight, I presume? True. true uh, tr totally true. Now, in terms of standardization of dose, um, I would highly advise that uh, the mushrooms are dry. This is usually in a dehydrator. Um, not at super high heat because psilocybin is uh, heat sensitive, it will degrade at high heat. Um, but most people will dry their mushrooms, then they will weigh them uh, in, and see how, how many grams they're taking. And then oftentimes I'll either put them in a tea because it's water soluble, psilocybin is water soluble. So if you, if you steep it as a tea and keep it below boiling, even though some people will boil the living daylights out of their dose and apparently it still works, um, most people, uh, to avoid the chitin, which is what forms up the um, actual physical body of the mushroom, it's the same type of substance that you find on like shellfish that makes their shell. Um, it's quite indigestible, so it can lead to a little bit of nausea or tummy stuff. So some people will um, steep their mushrooms um, for a certain period of time and then they'll cast out the mushroom body and they'll just drink the water and that'll be their dose. Um, but other people will take their mushrooms fresh um, we need to remember that these mushrooms are coprophilic and more, more often than not you're going to be picking them out of cow poo. So I would advise um, some sort of sterilization regime and this is where that tea process comes in because you're using water hot enough to fry any nasties that are in there. But some people certainly will um, ingest fresh mushrooms, however the only difference is they're much more potent and certainly um, all of the cocktail of different um, chemicals which are within the psilocybin mushroom, so psilocybin, psilocin, aeroginacin, biocystin, norbiocystin, the list goes on, they all have um, discrete effects and I would say very uh, much like cannabis and the entourage effect, if you have them all together they have a certain effect, if you have them in isolation they have a different effect. Um, so the effect from having uh, fresh mushrooms is they will the effect will come on much quicker and it's usually much stronger um, because in the drying process as I say psilocybin is heat sensitive you will lose some of the active constituents as you dry it down yeah more questions please so, so sorry just to clarify there's no harm in eating them right? no no absolutely not no no um, eating them fine not eating them fine um, yeah not going to be an issue but as I say for some people um, you know, like as I spoke about, yeah, the chitin's really going to upset your tummy. So if we're talking about Kalindi EE dose that I talked about earlier, 40 grams, that's not going to go down too well. And his protocol, was, his protocol was you just sit there and you eat it. You eat dry, you just eat 40 dry grams, have a sip of water, just keep eating it. Might throw up some. Oh, how much do I reckon that was? Oh, two grams. All right, another two grams goes in. 
yeah, extreme, I would say, I would class that as, but a discipline, and certainly from a martial artist, I wouldn't expect too much more, or less. You look like you've got a question, sister. Okay, yes. Um, if I pick the wrong mushroom um, and ingest it, what symptoms will I experience and when will I know to go and seek help? Okay, that's a really good question. Now, it's going to depend on the mushroom that you eat um, and how much of them you eat, of course. Now, with the... Um, Luckily for us, with the Cubensis mushroom and the Paneola cyanescens mushroom, there aren't any, uh, there's not like gallerina mushrooms that look exactly like them, that you'll find around them, up here. Um, certainly, if we're talking about uh, Psilocybe subaeruginosa, which are high altitude, low temperature mushrooms that you'll find South Australia, Victoria, and, and in sort of like the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, they're pine forest mushrooms, they're... Um, they don't like the poo, they like the pine and the bark. Um, they grow directly next to gallerina mushrooms, so the identification of them is essential. We, we do have a little bit of wriggle room here, but certainly I would, I would expect a sore tummy, cramps, um, certain mushrooms will give numb lips and um, things like that. Um, it's really going to be a, a, a case of um, trying to avoid speculation about whether you've eaten the right mushroom once you start to come up. Let's just say you've, you've picked the right mushroom but you think it was the wrong one, that's not going to be fun. That's going to be really quite significant. So again, uh, the reason that I um, have the four golden rules in my book is just so that you know if this is something you want to pursue. When you've identified it, you know what it is. You've, you've, in your mind you're set, no, this is what it is, I've found the right one. Um, there's no chance here. So that when the effects start to come on, you're not going to reach for the telephone and call the ambulance straight away. Oh, I think I'm dying. What did you have? Psilocybin mushrooms. Oh, yeah, give it an hour. You know, <laughs> give it two hours. Yeah. Um, but certainly I can't give you a clinical um, kind of breakdown of the, of the symptomology and all the rest of it because there's so many different mushrooms that you could ingest. And again, we're all unique individuals. I might just get a little bit of an upset tummy, might spend a couple of hours on the loo, you might be fine. You might just shake it off. So, yeah. But we're not we're not dealing with gallerina uh, death cap mushrooms alongside cubensis and paneola cyanescens. Oftentimes they're just together. And the mushrooms that you find around them, uh, if you follow those golden rules, you're going to steer clear of those anyway. So you should be right. Absolutely. When we're talking about psilocybin containing mushrooms, yes, they will show blue, but. Um, yes, they should. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Yeah, so we talk, you're talking more about um, Liberty Caps, Similanciata. So they're a little bit less common. Um, they certainly are around here. Yeah, 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 tiny. Yeah, they work, but very strong, like you're saying. Yeah, put you put you down, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So we really want to have that um, indicator of the blueness of the uh, psilocybin oxidizing. Uh, I'm, I would say that the slower that they're dried, the less of the degradation of psilocybin you're going to encounter. So I would say they probably will have higher potency if you, slow, if you dry them slower. I'm not advocating it though. Okay. Question? Someone? No? Yes, sir. I don't think you need to worry about it. I mean, I, I um, oh, sorry, no, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that. I've re-understood your question. Um, certainly, um, most cattle, commercial cattle, have quite the dosage of who knows what uh, for ticks and worms and blah de blah de blah blah. So um, certainly, um, if you are on good terms with a natural farmer or you have cattle yourself and you know exactly what's gone into them and what's been put onto them, that would be far preferable uh, than a random roll of the dice of old mate who, you know, is, is dipping his cattle and all the rest. No, no judgment there, I'm just saying obviously
there's chemicals that are going into the animal's organism and it's going to eliminate those and, and some of those are going to come out in the, in the manure for sure. So um, obviously the cleaner the better. It's the same with cannabis. We want our uh, cannabis as clean as we can possibly have it with no uh, artificial fertilizers or any sort of chemicals that are aimed at killing or impairing the function of the plant uh, because of course if we're going to take it into ourselves, that probably isn't the best idea. Yeah. Um, I would suggest you look that up. Uh, <laughs> that's a complicated question, but um, what Sister's alluding to is how you actually cultivate mushrooms. Um, usually it involves a spore print that I said before, creating a liquid culture. Um, the mushroom spores are activated by water. I talked about the significance of water to the mushroom earlier. Um, and certainly they need a substrate to grow in. So a lot of people will use brown, a brown rice tech for that. Um, but as I said, it is a pretty steep learning curve. It involves a lot of sterilization, um, preparation of substrates and um, rice cookers and, you know, uh, temperature uh, heaters and all sorts of craziness. Uh, I am by no means an expert on that. But um, it's all there. As I said, the McKenna brothers, uh, Terence and Dennis, a long time ago published a book on how to cultivate magic mushrooms. It's still around today. It's a simple Google search. You'll find uh, a whole lot of stuff. There is a little bit of uh, use of syringes, like proper medical syringes for injecting spores into substrate and stuff like that. Um, it can get a little bit complicated and fiddly, as I understand, but um, in this uh, context, certainly what um, brother up here mentioned about the cow poo, well, then you can certainly uh, get around that whole thing. The only thing I will say about cultivated mushrooms is, generally speaking, they're much more potent than wild-crafted mushrooms. Why that is, I don't know, uh, but it's probably similar to do uh, a similar case with medical cannabis. If it's grown in a controlled environment and given all of the uh, right um, environmental conditions, you'll get a certain product. You take that outside and you grow it out in the, the rain and the sun and the wind and all the rest of it. Uh, it's going to it's going to change the expression of that that uh, organic product. So uh, probably similar there. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't advise eating fly agaric. What um, sister's talking about there is the Amanita muscaria mushroom, or the, the fairy mushroom, the red mushroom with the white dots on the top that we know and love so much. Don't eat those ones. Um, they are very toxic uh, when you eat them fresh. They need to be uh, processed uh, usually by drying or boiling. Um, and what we're talking about with Amanita muscaria is not psilocybin. We're talking about another chemical which is called muscamol. Uh, it has very different effects. It doesn't work on the serotonergic system, um, but uh, it's certainly classed as uh, plant medicine um, and uh, used um, by a Siberian shaman uh, for a long time. But yes, the uh, muscamol is, is um, processed by the body differently to psilocybin, and as I understand it, if you eat uh, Amanita muscaria after you've cured it and, and you've processed it properly, you might want to collect your urine and drink that. Uh, because the body processes the muscimol out of the um, Amanita muscaria and you eliminate it through your urine, but that's actually what you want. That's actually the active component. So if you drink your urine, you'll get a pretty heavy dose of that. Not that I'm advocating that either. It's just that. Yeah, no, definitely not. So sister saying very stimulating effects uh, from the arbutanic uh, acid translating into the muscimol there. Mm. But yeah, very different uh, mushroom genus and species that we're talking about. Mm. There was one up the back, yes. Tree lovers paralysis. Tree lovers paralysis, yes. Uh, so uh, what sister's talking about here is um, what we've been talking about is coprophilic mushrooms, not tree lovers. We've been talking about poo lovers. Now, uh, what we're alluding to here is more the Psilocybe subarachinosa, or Psilocybe australiana, if you want to call them that. Um, but these are the cold weather, high altitude mushrooms. Now, they're, they're known as wood lovers because they prefer the um, decomposing pine needles and pine bark to grow on and colonise. Um, a lot, uh, um, a lot of users report paralysis. Um, I would, I would tend to frame it more in, in, in body load. 
uh, but also uh, um, in terms of the potency of subarachnosa. It certainly has the capacity to um, incapacitate the user. Um, but it's very, very common with subarachnosa. I understand it's quite com common with Paneola cyanescens as well. Um, certainly that ataxia is, is the name that we probably give that, which is sort of like loss of motor control and, and paralysis, um, can certainly be one of the more negative side effects of um, engaging with psilocybin um, as a whole, psilocybin mushrooms, because um, not only can you feel like you're disassociating or exiting your physical body, you can lose motor function. So again, um, as I said earlier, if you're thinking about exploring these, and, and especially in higher doses, you really want to think about having a trip to someone there to keep you safe and reassure you that everything's okay and, and who can give you the assistance and the assurance that you might need because it can get pretty hairy when you feel like you can't move. Uh, and literally it's not just, oh, I feel like I can't move. You won't, you won't be moving. It'll be paralysis like Sister said. So, um, yeah, it's certainly something... Um, to consider with the wood lovers, but even with Paneola cyanescens. I suspect it's probably um, due to the higher psilocin content, but again, as I said earlier, um, all magic mushrooms are a, are a cocktail of a variety of different chemicals, and we don't even know, until recently, scientists didn't know what um, aeragonacin did. It's a chemical within a lot of magic mushrooms. It's actually responsible for the bliss the bliss that uh, users feel uh, when they take it. If, it's high, if you have mushrooms high in aeragonosin, you'll get the, a very blissful uh, experience. If it's quite low in it, you'll get other effects accentuated. Yeah, so it's, it's all a bit of a cocktail there, and, and there's a lot of unknowns about uh, the mushroom constitution and what the, the uh, compounds within, apart from psilocin and psilocybin and a couple of other others, uh, we're not really sure what they all do. No, no, no. It'll be, it'll be, um, yeah, ataxia in that you'll feel quite physically your motor function will be severe, severely impaired or, or just completely gone. Uh, it's, it's only temporary though. It's usually a couple of hours, and, and you should be in full, full um, function again. Yes, mate. Go for it. Absolutely. So, um, Professor Nutt and his fMRI research, which continues to this day, he works in the Imperial College in London, um, he and his colleagues did, uh, in their studies, found that um, the neurological correlates of consciousness, if I can put it that way, so if you put a certain substance into the human brain, and certainly we're talking about psychedelics, so LSD is one of them, um, ayahuasca most people will be familiar with, that is just, uh, uh, well, not just, but it is strongly DMT, which is what is in mushrooms as well, um, mescaline amongst others, um, they'll have the effect of changing the circulation of the blood in the brain. And when we um, go from a, a strongly um, uh, circulating uh, node in the brain to another one, that shifts our consciousness. And certainly uh, the researchers identified what they call the default mode network, which is the main type of our brain that we use most of the time, and our task positive network, which is more the brain, that uh, part of the brain or, or the consciousness that you access when you go into your um, meditative practice or your yoga or your qigong or your, your drumming or whatever it is that you do, your sound healing. Um, that will, there's, various, there's various ways to get to the top of the mountain. Psilocybin is only one of them. And all of these other plant medicines are one of them. Can you do it in other ways? Absolutely you can. Um, but uh, in terms of meditation, if I want to be a Theravadan monk uh, and, and I can switch consciousness at the drop of a hat, well, I might have to study in a monastery for 10,000 hours most of my life before I can cultivate that skill. Or I can take a stiff dose of psilocybin and it's going to do that for me, but it's going to force it. 
So herein lies the danger. If you're not used to these states of consciousness and if you're not used to modulating your consciousness and you take something thinking, oh, this is going to just be like alcohol or this is just going to be like cannabis. No, it's not. It's going to radically shift your consciousness and it's going to force it. So if you don't want to, and this is where a lot of people get in trouble, oh, I wish it would end, oh, I don't want to, oh, I don't want to be here, I want it to stop. If you're on the roller coaster, you bought the ticket, you get off when it stops. That's it. So you get, and I guess I'll make this comment too. I'm a firm believer that when you engage with plant medicines, you get what you're supposed to get. Regardless of whether it's good, bad, or other, oh, it's so awesome, I saw God, great, oh, it's terrifying, I'll never do that again. Yeah, you got what you were supposed to get. Um, and this is where the, the pharmaceuticalization of this field gets a little bit murky because we, they want us all to have the same experience. You can't, we're all different. And this medicine doesn't work like most medicines. It works on so many different levels. So, but my opinion is if you have a bad trip, you're supposed to have a bad trip, sorry. If you had a good trip, you're supposed to have a good trip. Well done. Congratulations. Um, you know, ideally, if we're going to engage with these types of plant medicines, we start the, the mushroom or the vine or whatever it is that we're going to engage with or the plant. The work starts as soon as you consider, oh, this is something I might want to do. That's when the work starts. You start to work on yourself going, okay, what have I got? I might just take a little bit of personal stock here. What's going on inside? Because if I don't and it's all just jammed in my face at, at the drop of the hat, that's going to be overwhelming. If I can take some of the responsibility again on myself, on my own healing journey, oh, okay, yeah, that's right, I'm working with this, I've had this grief or this loss or this trauma, Who I better just, just touch back into that a little bit before I stick it in my face and I can't escape it. I might just want to familiarise myself with it and get start to do some of the work myself, what I can do myself, and then hopefully the plant medicine will help me do the rest because at the end of the day, it is your consciousness. You are your healer. These uh, plants can help us, help our body to heal us, but at the end of the day, we heal ourselves. So the more responsibility we can all take for our healing, the better we'll all be. Thank you for listening, everybody. And thank you, sister.